starting the transmission. All right, fire. Oh, forgot my water. Hang on. Now, I swear I do this for a living. Fire away. And then we just have a few minutes more. I'm just going to ask you to put on mute the web page. Mark, we can be chatting a little bit. And uh, after eight o'clock and around eight o'clock, we're going to start. Okay. Just see if everything's okay. So the idea, Mark, is that we're going to do a simultaneous translation. So I'm going to be asking in Portuguese and then asking in English. And then you just try to make it up a uh, three to four sentences, uh, or maybe I will I will interrupt you in order to do the translation, okay? So it's going to be a really informal talk and we're just going through the topics. Okay. Have you been to Brazil already? No, I have not. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I was checking out your videos about Australia and Fiji, and man, that's that was a nice trip. Yeah, we uh, we had to push Australia until next year, mm -hmm. but uh, hopefully Fiji and Vanuatu still happen this year if those countries open up. I'm hoping they will. Oh, that's nice. That's quite nice. I think it's quite strange that in Asia there is not so much so many cases like here in America and Europe. This is one of the things that I have been asking myself about. Uh, well, they, people there are good at you know um, following authority. Here in the United States, they're not so you know people don't want to do something and they don't do it. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. The, the same thing over here but anyway it's it's incredible to see only 900 1000 deaths and uh, casualties and uh, over here we just my god reaching so many australia has had less than 100 deaths incredible yeah really amazing you've done really good <clears throat> So you want me to go to mute when you start? Yes, yeah, so we, we can do that. That's not, don't worry, I'm going to give a five minute uh, introduction and then, uh, and then I will ask, I will ask you to, to come in and then don't worry, it's, it's going to be quite informal. I'm just getting familiar as well with uh, with uh, with Zoom, this is the first time that I'm a hosting. And now we are going to start. Bem, pessoal, nós vamos estar começando agora o nosso reivindicado de transmissão. Já estamos aí com o Mark Callahan. E a trans, essa, essa ideia dessa, dessas entrevistas são que a gente traga um lado mais de curiosidades de como essas pessoas que são importantes para o nosso hobby começaram a trajetória delas e quais são os planos para o futuro. O Mark é o primeiro dessa série. Nós vamos estar recebendo agora na terça-feira Mark Leveson, o Melev, né? também um outro YouTube de grande, de grande presença aí no, no nosso hobby além de grandes importadoras aí, Talarico, do Grupo Onda, 
que usa do Ipiranga. E estamos aí confirmando com vários outros. A ideia são reuniões, conversas, entrevistas nas quartas-feiras e nos sábados, sempre às 8 horas. Então, a todos aqueles que não são inscritos ainda, eu peço que se inscrevam, que acompanhem aí o nosso, o nosso conjunto, aí, as nossas novidades aí que nós vamos estar trazendo aí para o para o nosso mundo referente ao aquário marinho, tá? Uh, como já comentei com vocês, o Mark vai ser o nosso primeiro convidado. Mas antes de nós, uh, de nós continuarmos, de nós iniciarmos, na verdade, eu gostaria de tomar um minuto e falar um pouquinho aqui sobre um dos, dos autores que tiveram grande importância assim, no, na minha entrada para o hobby. Em 2008, quando eu retomei, e retomei de verdade o, o Aquarismo Marinho, o primeiro livro que eu comprei, né, que eu trouxe lá através da Amazon, foi este aqui. Livro este deste cidadão, Robert Fenner, o Bob Fenner sempre esteve envolvido aí no, no ramo do aquarismo, uma vida inteira, e passou por todas, todas as partes da cadeia, desde lojista, a coletora, a importador. E o Bob, infelizmente, faleceu na quinta-feira, aos 67 anos. Quinta-feira, agora, dia 7. A princípio, ele faleceu de... teve um ataque cardíaco, né? E ele nos deixou aí com milhares de artigos, centenas de artigos. O site dele, o Wet Web Media, foi, um dos, foi o primeiro ponto de, de, de coleta de informações em que eu busquei. E das publicações dele, esse livro aqui talvez seja o mais vendido para o nosso hobby. As reuniões, elas vão ser, essas entrevistas vão ser tomadas em português e em inglês para que o público internacional também compreenda e o nosso, os nossos entrevistados também, tá? Então, vou estar falando em português e vou começar a parte inglês. Uh, so, guys, first of all, I would like to thank you all for, for being here and uh, we are going to do this uh, type of interviews every Wednesdays and Saturdays with uh, figures from our, for our beloved hobby internationally and also on the Brazilian scale. Uh, for international, we are going to have Mark Callahan today and then we're going to have Mark Levison next uh, Wednesday. Also for the Brazilian industry, we have uh, going to have the main importers. I'm going to, uh, to tell you about uh, Alexandre Talarico, who is uh, the oldest one, the one that have been for many business already that passed through many businesses here in Brazil and he's already on the field for about uh, 20 years, I believe. More than 20 years, for sure, more than 20 years. Almost 30 years on the, the acquiring business, acquiring trade, and he's the exclusive dealer for Red Sea products for, among others. And also, Kiusley from Iperanga Peixes, who is the Bobo Magus exclusive dealer and also Triton. So we are going to receive them along this... Uh, month along May 2020, every Wednesday and Saturdays. So the ones who aren't subscribed to our channel, I'm asking you to please do it. The interviews are going to be conducted in both English and Portuguese. Beside we saw, before we start with Mark, I'm going to, to take a minute in order to talk about uh, how I came back to this hobby. I came back to this hobby in, uh, in the end of 2008 and beginning of 2009. And uh, the only publication that uh, which I needed to import from, from USA, import via Amazon, it was uh, this book, The Conscious Marine Aquarist. This was the first book that I have imported over there and uh, the first one that I read about our, our hobby. And it was written by Robert Fenner. Bob Fenner has been in the hobby, in the industry for many years, been a public figure since the 70s. And he did work in all, all, uh, all parts of the chain of this business, from retailer to also collector and importer. Um, 
Bob living in San Diego, California. And uh, he wrote more than a dozen books, especially this one, who we can say is the most well-selling book in, in our hobby with more than uh, 100,000 uh, 100, copies sold. And uh, Bob passed away last uh, 7th May, three days ago, two days ago. I was intending to invite him as well for this talk, but unfortunately he just passed away with six, seven years. So yes, I'm going to, to thank you, Bob, for all the things that you have done and uh, you're going to be missed. And uh, today, today we have Mr. Mark Callahan. He's the creator from the Saltwater Tank TV a channel that I have been subscribed for many years. For I was talking to him about seven years already. Let me show you, share the screen with you guys. So we have, uh, Mark has been publishing to YouTube for almost 10 years already, more than 10 years already. And uh, well, I can say that I have watched most of his videos and he's also a big part from my formation here as an aquarist, especially the quick tips. It was something that I, use, I always use it to follow. And uh, he has authored and co-authored more than six books already. And uh, his presentations in Machina are also well known. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mark Callahan, Mr. Saltwater Tank. Thank, thanks, Ido, for the great introduction. Sorry I cannot be with you all uh, in Brazil, but uh, a little virus got in the way. Então, pessoal, me traduzindo o Mark Callahan. Ele é o proprietário daquele canal de YouTube. Já são mais de 10 anos já em que ele posta, ele tem mais de 70 mil inscritos. E o Mark também é, faz parte aí da minha formação como aquarista. Eu acompanho os canais, o canal dele há pelo menos 7 anos. E tem uma série muito bacana que são dicas rápidas do, do, sobre o nosso hobby que eu gosto, particularmente gosto muito. Quem ainda não é inscrito no canal dele, não conhece os vídeos dele, eu estou deixando o link aqui na descrição. E uh, uma introdução aí para o seu Mark. Ele agradece a presença, agradece o convite. E é uma pena que ele não pode estar no Brasil com esse ano. Nós estávamos planejando que ele viesse aqui participar conosco da, da conferência, da conferência anual que é realizada pelo canal Riff Marinho aí pela figura do Tamit que ele viria pessoalmente, né? Mas infelizmente estamos aí com esse com esse tipo de problema aí que está afetando muito aí que esse COVID-19. A ideia desse 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 programa, então, é que nós vamos escutar um pouco da história do Mark, nós vamos conhecer um pouco mais a trajetória e nós vamos estar tratando várias questões aí pessoais e de como ele está nesse hobby. So the idea of this interview again is going to be bringing personal questions and about your tra trajectory, Mark. How you came over here? How you decided to make this uh, this beloved hobby a business to you? And uh, how everything started? Everything started for me in 1989. My dad got me a 75-gallon uh, uh, aquarium. That's thinking, hang on, let me do the conversion. <laughs> About 150 liters, I believe. <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah, 283. Ah, 283. Okay. Oh my God, that's a big one. Yeah, a uh, 75 gallon tank was the first one, uh, mm -hmm. Christmas Day, 1989. How old are you, were you over there? 10. 10 years old. Então, para o Mark, tudo começou quando ele tinha 10 anos de idade, em 1989. Ele ganhou o primeiro tanque do pai dele de Natal. E esse tanque tinha 283 litros. And, um, so that was the first tank with undergravel filter, uh, fake coral, and uh, many tank crashes. 
Ele começou com, com o Jalbert, né? Com, com o, as placas de, de filtragem. Corais mortos e, infelizmente, ele teve muitos e muitos crashes, né? Muitos e muitos problemas aí que acabaram matando tudo. And, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of information hey. back then. <laughs> Who is this lady? <laughs> this hey. is my daughter, Markel. Hi, Markel. Greetings from Brazil. You know where Brazil is? No, she doesn't know where Brazil is yet. Oh, my God. But Carnival, you know about it. No, you can't. She's too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> Essa é a filha dele, a Markel. Ela tem... She's uh, eight, eight years old, right? Seven years uh, old. Six. 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 Ela tá com seis anos de idade e ela ainda não conhece ainda o Brasil. <risos> Perguntei para ele se, eles, se ela já não conhecia, não conhecia o carnaval, daí ele disse que não, não, ela é muito nova para isso. Okay. Um, so, well, I mean, back then we didn't have, there was no internet, so not a lot of good information. Uh -huh. You purely relied on books and your local fish store and hopefully you had a good local fish store. And which city was that? Uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee. So that, that, was, it, that place is now a coffee shop. Uh -huh. então, infelizmente, quando ele começou né, na cidade de Nashville, no Tennessee, uh, onde ele morava, não tinha, não tinha internet, obviamente. E ele tinha que basear o conhecimento dele em livros e muito na loja, nas lojas uh, de aquarismo lá que tinham. E hoje, infelizmente, essa loja não existe mais e já acabou virando uma acabou virando uma loja de café. And Mark, uh, how, how was the business over there when you started? There, there's a lot of marine tanks already, a lot of reef tanks. When I started, there was no reef tanks because there's very few because mm -hmm. no one could keep coral. Mm -hmm. so was, you're lucky if you could keep fish for very long. We didn't have a lot of good information. There's so much we didn't know. Uh -huh. Quando ele começou, não existia, praticamente não tinha nada de rifes, né? De aquários com corais. E era, era sortudo quem conseguia manter os peixes por muito tempo. And the main fishes were imported from? Um, you know, we got a lot of stuff from Hawaii. Yellow tangs. Um, some stuff from Indo. It was, you know, it's more about... You just go and you'd see a fish at your local fish store and you buy it because there was no delivery. You know, there's no internet to buy anything. Uh huh. So okay. that was uh, you saw a pretty fish and you bought it and hoped it lived. Tinha muitos uh, muitos peixes do Havaí, né? O Havaí é um território dos Estados Unidos e, por exemplo, o yellow tongue era um que tinha presença e ele só chegava lá, olhava o peixe, achava bonito e comprava. And over there, how much was a, a yellow tank? Oh, geez, that was. The late 80s, so it was probably 20 dollars, 20 US dollars. Uh -huh. And nowadays, how much does it cost? Mm, uh, and you can get a wild caught yellow tank for like 40. Mm -hmm. I think. Antigamente custava question. 20 dólares, né? Quando, quando tinha aquela idade, custava 20 dólares um yellow tank. E hoje, geralmente, tem torno de 40. If you knew about the fish price over here, Mark, you would get gray hair like myself. And believe me, I'm younger than you. So <laughs> the prices <laughs> over here, it's, oh my God, it's, it drives us crazy. <laughs> Why is it so much? Oh man, import taxes, fees. Uh, you can't believe that. So it's uh, the best thing that the Brazilian government do is to take money from the people, especially huh. the state, the state province, you know, and yellow tank, well, uh, since we are going to have this situation, this lockdown situation, the exchange rate went crazy just a skyrocket this year our money lost about uh, 45 percent so it's it's completely crazy and yellow time now before it was about hundred dollars now it's less because our money doesn't uh, doesn't worth anything but in yellow tongue it would be around hundred dollars wow eu estava falando para o Mark que é uma loucura a questão dos preços dos animais aqui, né? E que uh, simplesmente o nosso, a nossa moeda desvalorizou completamente, foi mais de 45% de desvalorização esse, esse ano, né? Por causa dessa questão do, do isolamento social. E que, infelizmente, um, um yellow tang, por exemplo, custa para nós 100 dólares, né? 
and which type of fish you 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 got over there and why have your father decided to give you that he he liked the fish he already had the fish a few before or what i think he wanted one so he figured he would give it to me oh that's a smart guy <laughs> That's a smart guy. Similar thing that I do with my wife. I'm going to give her a fish or a coral. And <laughs> smart. That's smart. <laughs> o Mark ganhou do pai dele. Provavelmente o pai dele queria, né? E acabou, e acabou comprando esse aquário para ele. And uh, which type of fish you got over there? And how long you kept them? How, how was your first experience when, it's, when you had them? Uh... The first tank was many crashes because back then you wanted white live rock. So and your live rock was coral skeleton, so you would bleach it once a month to make it white again. Oh. And this happened to too when, Mark? Uh, this was in the 80s, late 80s, because it was all about white, white coral. Mm -hmm. We didn't have live rock, it was just coral skeleton. So you bleached it because you wanted it nice and clean and white. Mm -hmm. And when have you started keeping corals? Um, well, I got out of the hobby for 15 years. And when I got back in in 07, 2007, that's when I started keeping corals. Uh -huh. Ele ficou, ele acabou se afastando do hobby, né? E em 2007 ele retornou. Ele acabou ficando afastado por questões pessoais. Em 2007 ele voltou a ter os, os, os corais. Já começou com os corais. And over there, you kept already with LEDs or you went through T5? Uh, well, when I got back into it, there was uh, there's no LEDs. So it was T5s only or in uh, metal halides. That's what, what people used back then. In 2007, when I got back into the hobby. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, when when were the first next stretches? The next question is going to be when, when you started getting... Uh, Getting Acroporos, for example, the most uh, the most difficult ones. And how long have your first fishes lived? Since you mentioned to me that you asked it, uh, you told me that you had many crashes. Right. So you're asking how long did the fish live back then? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, it was not very long back then. It didn't make it. Um, my tank crashed about once every three months because I killed the live rock off once every month. We didn't understand that it was killing the biofilter. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's why it was uh, not very successful. The first tank. Now, when I got back into the hobby, it was much, much different. Much different. Yes, I believe that the information traveled, traveled not so easily, right? Although there were some people that are already keeping some... some Soft corals, I believe that uh, it's not so much exchangeable information, right? Right. It was all, uh, Holcim Xenia was a big coral to keep back then. If you mm -hmm. could keep that alive, you were the best of the best. And from 2007, Mark, have you kept, uh, there is still any fish alive? How old is the oldest fish that you're already keeping? Uh, that's a good question. So she's been with me. So I had, I moved um, in about 2012. I moved from Texas to Tennessee, which is about 600 miles. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 so you were born in, in Texas? No, I moved. I was born in Tennessee, here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, but I went to college, went to university, moved around the country. Mm -hmm. And then my wife and I moved to Tennessee in 2012. I set up a new tank, didn't quarantine, got marine velvet, and lost everything. Oh, so boy. New fish. Então, ele, ele foi estudar no Texas e se mudou em 2012 de volta para o Tennessee, tá? Ele, eu perguntei para ele sobre os peixes mais antigos que ele tinha. Então, infelizmente, em 2012, ele acabou tendo a Brooklyn Nella, né, que é o Marine Velvet, e isso acabou matando todos todos os peixes dele. So the current one, the oldest one that you have it, that have been keeping. Uh, she's uh, my blonde Nexo tank is the oldest. She's still she's in this tank here, and mm -hmm. I've had her since 2012. So she's eight years, years old. É o peixe mais antigo que ele tem é um naso, um naso 
mas o Blonde tem oito anos já com ele. And uh, how how is the the you mentioned to me that you have lived in Texas. Uh, which was your major? What what have you studied over there, Mark? So when I went to university, I was going to be a veterinarian, so I actually studied horses. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my professors talked me out of that. So then I started my own business, um, did some things, moved, worked in television for a while, made some movies, full-length movies. Um, oh, really? Went, that I didn't yeah. knew it. And went to financial advising, didn't like that. Mm -hmm. So then I started Mr. Sawater Tank TV. Ah, então o Mark ele foi para a universidade para estudar medicina veterinária e ele queria ele queria fazer a especialização em cavalos, né, em equinos, mas ele acabou saindo, pulando pulando fora disso, né? E ele acabou trabalhando na, na, no cinema. Ele fez alguns filmes, mas depois ele acabou focando na questão do 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 aquarismo. And as you mentioned to me, a full length movies that you have done and to, can can you tell us a few names so we can search around? Oh, so the um, what movie did I? Uh, it was one movie called I Crime. My like Cry. Yeah, uh -huh. like iPhone but I Crime. Okay. And then I forgot the name of that other movie. Uh, and you you were movie. acting no, no. So I, uh, I was first assistant camera. So I was uh -huh. the guy with the, the clapper, the slate. Okay. In front of the camera. That was me. Oh. But but how 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 have you done that? Because you have uh, made your bachelor, right? You finished uh, your yes. university. Correct. What, how how you went from being a veterinarian, for a major in veterinary, and you went out to this field. Uh, my professors recommended that I do not become a veterinarian. Um, so it's a, uh, you know, hard life, very physical job. You can get, because I wanted to work with horses. So you get kicked and bit. Uh, the money isn't that great. And you get calls in the middle of the night. You have to go out and things like that. Okay. So they recommended that I not do that. So then I started marketing horses with uh, DVDs. So the young people won't know what those are, but that was uh, my first business was filming stallions and putting it on a DVD and shipping it to people. Oh, então o Mark, depois que ele se formou em medicina veterinária, ele acabou desistindo de seguir essa profissão, porque é muito árdua, tem uma pouca remuneração. E ele começou nessa questão de, de filmes, né? Fazer gravações dos cavalos para vender, para mandar para o para as pessoas interessadas em comprar esses cavalos. E logo depois, ele acabou iniciando no, no Saltwater Tank TV, no canal do YouTube dele. E, Mark, uh, so you so you decided to go from your hobby. It was already two years since you started back there, because it was 2007 that you came back, and 2012 this happened, right? So that's uh, a... 2012 is when I had moved and had marine velvet, but I got back. I had some tanks from 2007 to 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the YouTube channel started? Um, I had a camera and I had a video camera and I knew how to edit and I liked to be on camera and I hated my job. So I decided that uh, I might as well start making videos. So I just started making saltwater videos. Uh huh. And back yeah. then you didn't start making maintenance and projects for your clients. You still have the business. Uh, I was just making videos for fun because it sounded like a good idea. Uh -huh. Então ele não gostava do emprego dele. Ele tinha uma câmera e assim ele começou o Saltwater Tank TV. Ele não fazia nada profissionalmente relacionado a isso, ou seja, o serviço de manutenção, de consultoria que hoje ele presta. And uh, when it started, Mark, when have you decided to make it besides the YouTube channel? Uh, when did I want to make it my career? Yes. And uh, when you decided to make it your career and when you decided to make the, the consulting services that you do, the maintenance service that you do, 
So I started the first video I did in 2010 in about March. Mm -hmm. And then in October, I decided that this would be my full-time job. So I shut down my video business mm -hmm. and just went 100% into this. Três meses depois que ele formou o canal dele, ele decidiu que ele iria se dedicar exclusivamente para isso. Então ele fechou a empresa que ele tinha de filmagens e começou a se dedicar para isso. And how were the first clients? How the business start to gain to gain scale? So my, you know, at first I didn't consult, I didn't build tanks. All I did was make shows, and I had sponsors. So I had sponsors, and then I wrote books. And then one day, someone came to me and said, "Build me a fish tank. <laughs> Build me a saltwater tank." Uh -huh. And I said no, and they said yes. And finally, I decided that I should throw some crazy number at him. And if he said yes, and I would do it, uh, uh -huh. he said yes. So then I went and built my first tank, which was uh, probably 2010. Mm -hmm. 2011-ish, I guess, somewhere in there. Yeah, 2011. Então, o Mark, ele não... Ele, ele começou com o canal, ele se dedicou com o canal e ele vivia praticamente com os patrocínios que ele tinha nesse canal. Ele não trabalhava com manutenção e não trabalhava com os projetos. Mas, com a insistência de alguns clientes, ele jogou um número alto da cabeça dele e esse cliente disse que pagaria isso e assim ele começou. And how many tanks have you built since then? How many tanks have I had since then? Or that built? You have built? Oh, I lost count. I don't know how many it's been. And it's all Anything? over the country, right? Yeah, all over the country. Oh, that's nice. But uh, anyway, anyway, near 200, 300, 400? Um, so for a while, I would, if you wanted a tank, then I would tell you, what gear to buy, and then you would put it together. Mm -hmm. um, so if I include, I don't do that anymore, but if I included that along with the ones that I designed, I actually build probably 75 to 100. Mm -hmm. Então, entre números de 75 a 200 tanques, ele já ajudou a construir. Ele fazia serviços dele próprio montar, ou então de dar uma consultoria em especificar os equipamentos que a pessoa deve estar comprando. And... Uh, about e-shop. You had started also an e-shop and also the the being uh, the outer the books that I have done it. How these ideas came out? I started writing books and people were asking for information, so I I wrote a book and then with the book you got videos. So that was mm -hmm. 2011ish and I did that until about 2017 and then I was just too busy with building tanks and the information I felt was on a date. So um, didn't want to take the time to write a book because the book is about 400 hours worth of effort. And so then I stopped selling books um, and then just purely build tanks for clients. De 2011 a 2017, ele se dedicou à questão dos livros, né? Com a venda dos livros, acompanhava também um CD com os vídeos a respeito disso. E ele trabalhou, né? Trabalhou desta forma até 2017, quando ele decidiu se dedicar exclusivamente às montagens dos clientes. And Mark, which was the craziest build, the biggest tank that have already built? Um, well, I'm in the process of rebuilding a tank now that's 6,000 gallons. 6,000 gallons. Yeah, so that's... Um... I'm making the, the count. That's is 22,700 liters. That's a private tank? Uh, it's in a business, but it's uh -huh. the CFO's baby, so kind oh. of private. Oh, that's that's a lot. The protein skimmer is eight feet tall. That's crazy. Vou perguntar para ele qual foi o maior tanque que ele já trabalhou, e ele disse que ele está trabalhando agora num tanque de 22 mil litros que fica dentro de uma empresa. Então, é um, um tanque privado. And that's not the main business from this company, right? This is only for entertainment. Correct. It's in their lobby. <laughs> e esse tanque está só no, no hall de entrada. Não é, uh, não é parte do negócio. É simplesmente só para... Por hobby, por gostar disso que ele está fazendo. 
and how long it's going to take this build? Uh, I've been reworking it since November. So we'll probably have fish in it in July, August. Mm -hmm. So we would have been doing more with it, but you know, we can do this little virus thing, COVID, and put everything on hold for about six weeks. And you work alone, Mark, or you have a team working with you? Uh, it's just me. Just yourself. That's, yeah. that's a lot of hard work. Uh, that's all right. It keeps me honest. <laughs> and it's over there in Tennessee as well? It's in the central United States. Okay, so when you need to work over there, you just get the gear and, and travel over there. Yep, I got a suitcase uh, with my gear in it and some uh -huh. stuff, you know, they have drills and stuff. Um, but I check it under the plane and get on the plane and go and work on it. So I believe that's quite a, quite a, a hard service for doing, huh? You need to build a tank and then you go just go to the central. Central USA, all over USA, as you mentioned to me. And how many times have you gone there already? Uh, six. Oh my God. Six, and I probably got six or seven more trips until we get fish in it. Então, essa construção desse tanque de 22 mil litros, ele está trabalhando já desde novembro do ano passado. Fica no centro dos Estados Unidos, ele está no sudoeste. Ele já foi mais de seis vezes. Simplesmente para ele construir os tanques, já que ele trabalha sozinho, ele pega as coisas dele e ele vai de avião. Então, já esse, esse serviço aí já deve ser uma coisa bem, bem especial que paga passagem de avião, o cara tá indo lá montar. And uh, tell us about your e-shop. You mentioned to me before, before we started the meeting, that uh, you're not a uh, WeFit anymore, but... Uh, how you how you decided to go in this business and why you're not on it anymore? So I started writing books, which was my eShop. That's what I sold in my online store and did that for a number of years. And then I just got too busy with large projects like this 22,000 liter project. Mm -hmm. And everything needed to be rewritten because the information was out of date, I felt, but didn't want to take the time to rewrite it because I was too busy with custom aquariums. Nice. Então, o foco dele do, do e-shop era a venda dos livros, né? Que foi parada simplesmente porque faltou tempo, começou a ficar, faltar tempo por causa desses, dessas, uh, dessas questões aí de fazer os projetos e construções de aquário. And uh, the last professional question is going to be, Mark, which are the plans for the Mr. Saltwater Tank TV? Uh, you know, a lot of my time now is spent making videos for saltwateraquarium.com. Mm -hmm. They're an online retailer. I'll still, you know, I'm building a new aquarium, adding on to the house. Mm -hmm. So I'll put some more shows out about that. Most of my time is spent uh, doing videos for saltwateraquarium.com and then building tanks for clients. So less videos now, it's all custom aquariums, man. Então, o foco dele hoje está sendo no saltwater.com.com que é um dos patrocinadores dele, que ele faz vídeos e conteúdos para esse canal. E também os focos, também o foco já no trabalho dele, que é a construção e uh, os projetos do, do, do aquário dele, né? os projetos dos aquários dos clientes. Uh, we're going to, to have a few questions here from our clients. And uh, one from them has been asked from HIFTEC. They are the exclusive Triton sailor distributor here in Brazil. And his question is, since you have all these years of experience, which are the five main topics, five um, more special suggestions that give for the people that's already is just starting? So what advice do I have for people who are just starting? Yes. Great question. One, be patient. That can be hard. Primeiro, ser paciente. Isso pode ser uma coisa bem difícil de se conseguir. People see these pretty grown-out aquariums, and they think it happens overnight, but they don't have a sense of what that owner went through to get that tank to that pretty picture state. Uh, eu acredito que eu acabei esquecendo de falar em português qual que era a pergunta, né? A pergunta foi, 
pergunta do, do Riff Tech foi quais os pontos, os cinco mais valiosos conselhos que ele pode dar para alguém que está começando no hobby. Então, o primeiro foi ter paciência. Isso pode ser muito difícil. A gente acaba vendo aqueles corais gigantescos e aquilo não acontece de uma hora para outra. Tu tens que ter paciência. Um, I would also say you gotta find what works for you. There's many ways to run a saltwater tank and how I do it, how someone else does it, it may work for you, it may not. And the only thing we know is we need water and we need salt. And if you want to keep corals, you need light. But some people don't run a skimmer, some people do, some people don't do water changes, some people do. Find out what works for you, and then once you figure that out, do that. Tem várias formas de dar certo. A gente precisa é de água, sal e luz quando a gente quer ter corais. Então, tu tens que te sentir confortável com o método que tu escolhe. Algumas pessoas têm skimmer, outras não. Umas fazem TPA, outras não. Então, seja confortável com aquilo que dá certo. Existem vários caminhos para o sucesso. Eu também diria... Quarantine your fish. Uh, I didn't uh -huh. do that. I got marine velvet. Um, I've had clients who didn't quarantine, even though I told them to, and they got various diseases. So absolutely quarantine your fish. How many fish did you lost over there when you had this, this velvet? Uh, probably 15 and probably $2,000 worth of fish in a, oh three days. God. Oh my God. Who, who brought it? A clownfish? Uh, probably an angelfish. An angelfish. Yeah. That's my guess. Então, quarentenar os peixes. Isso é muito importante. Não fazer como ele não, como ele não fez. Ele perdeu 15 peixes, né? Por causa do Brooklyn Nella, Marine Velvet, em três dias. E isso detonou os peixes dele. Provavelmente veio em um peixe anjo. Foram mais de 200 dólares em peixe que ele acabou perdendo. I would also say that um, you, know, you got to be careful about who you take advice from. That's, uh -huh. Nowadays, it's very easy to share information. When I started, we didn't have that. And you know, look at whoever you're getting advice from, look at pictures of their tanks, see how they do things. Um, and does their style fit your style? Just because they do it doesn't mean that it has to work for you. Isso... Esse conselho que ele dá para nós é muito importante, né? Nós conversamos sobre isso nas lives passadas até. Sempre que alguém te dá um conselho, procura olhar o aquário dessa pessoa, porque hoje é muito fácil obter informação, seja através de um canal de YouTube, seja conversando com amigos, seja um WhatsApp. E são vários conselhos e a gente tem que ter cuidado de quem a gente vai escutar. Então, Atenção nisso, né? Atenção com quem tu vai escutar os conselhos. So say, you know, a lot of people get caught up in numbers. They feel like they get the ideal saltwater parameter numbers, like calcium's got to be 440. And uh -huh. they see their calcium at 420 and they feel like they need to dose. And that's why their corals aren't doing well, because their calcium is per se low. And it's really about what works for your tank and going with that. For example, I have a client's tank. I run the magnesium at 1650. And if I posted that in the forum, people would tell me everything's going to die. That's a problem. But the tank is doing really, really, really well. Uh -huh. E ter cuidado com números, né? Ele, por exemplo, tem um cliente que um dos aquários, um cliente dele, ele mantém com magnésio a 1650 ppm e todo mundo dizendo que vai morrer, que vai morrer, mas ele tem um bom tem um bom, um bom resultado com isso. Mark, another question. Uh, you mentioned about quarantine the, cor uh, quarantine the fish, and how about the corals? Have you had problems with that? Would you suggest this? So keeping a, if you can do it, absolutely do it. But keeping a coral quarantine tank is a lot more effort than uh, fish quarantine. Mm -hmm. You basically are running a whole nother reef setup. You have to maintain parameters. Um, 
and the two systems can't be tied together. So you have to run this tank and you have to run that tank and do the necessary maintenance on both of them to keep it steady, to keep it happy. So it's a lot of effort, but if you can do it, do it. Eu perguntei para o Mark quais seriam, se ele aconselhava também manter uma, uma quarentena para corais, já que ele sugeriu para os peixes. E a resposta foi que se tu tens condições de fazer isso, que tu o faça. Mas tem que levar em conta que vão ser dois aquários, dois sistemas completamente diferentes que tu vai ter que manter. Então é um monte de trabalho, né? É o trabalho dobrado que tu vai ter que conseguir fazer isso. Here in Brazil, we have uh, many, many provinces, many states that are by the seaside. And some of them asks, uh, uses natural seawater. I know that in Tennessee you don't have the, this option, but how do you see this? Um, what do I think of it? Yes. Uh, if I had access to natural seawater, I would absolutely use it. I mean, you got to filter it. I wouldn't just go get it at the beach and bring it back to my place. Mm -hmm. I would want it to filter it, so clean it up, because you never know what's in it. But if I could use it, I would absolutely use it. A pergunta lá da água natural versus água sintética, né? Se, qual é o ponto de vista dele? Essa pergunta aí foi feita pelo Marcelo Milano. Definitivamente eu iria utilizar, se ele tivesse acesso. Tennessee, mais uma vez, é no sudoeste, não tem acesso à praia, mas se ele tivesse essa possibilidade, com certeza ele faria e talvez passasse por algum pré-filtro. Mas é, sim, uma opção que ele, que ele consideraria. How about uh, fish problems? Do you have any fish problems? You mentioned to me that you have angelfish. Some angelfish are well-known cor coralivores. So which problems with fish you had besides the disease? Um, I, you know, I, I had a gold flick angel um, mm -hmm. that decided to eat meat corals. It can... Um, It can feel you. So, rather, I mean, I also try to keep reef safe angels, like genicanthus. Mm -hmm. So, I don't really have a problem with angels eating coral because I tend to avoid the ones that do eat coral. Mm -hmm. Então, em relação a problemas com peixes, né? Isso também foi uma das perguntas ali que aconteceram do Reef Marinho. E ele relatou simplesmente que ele evita esse tipo de peixe. Os anjos que ele tem são anjos que não são coralívoros, que evitam corais. Mark, a topic that uh, is included in the Coral Magazine this month is uh, regarding ICP testing. And there is a lot of a lot of controversy regarding it. How do you see the ICP testing here in our market? Um So I've sent out probably 100 ICP tests um, when tanks are doing well and when tanks are doing bad. Oh, you already using it. You already using it for for considerable time. Then 100 more, you already sent it. Yeah, and I like to do it because I think it's more accurate than me running a test. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's I don't feel like it's something that's so accurate that you can microdose your tank based off of it. Mm -hmm. But it's good if something is way on a whack. It's also really good for heavy metal detection because mm -hmm. we don't have a test kit for that. Um, Here in Brazil, there's a lot of controversy regarding the precision of the ICP testing from any brands. How is over there in the USA? Uh, you know, it's been one of the things why I said I don't microdose tanks based on it. I've had clients send in a water sample and I've sent in a water sample and the parameters in there are nearly the same even though the tank is different. And some parameters like iron that you never see, it's high on theirs and it's high on mine. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? And then I've even sent two tests on the same day with the same water and gotten wildly different results. So I really like to use it for heavy metal detection. And, but I'm not using it for saying like my strontium is low and then I'm going to put in this much of strontium based on what I see in ICP. Mm -hmm. So it's more about contamination that you're looking for. Yeah, I need to verify my own test results that I get um, either off my automatic tester, my Trident, my Netgem system Trident, or my own manual tests. 
perguntei para o Mark sobre a questão dos testes de CP, né? Aqui no Brasil nós estamos enfrentando uma grande controvérsia, assim, em todo mundo, na relação da precisão dos testes. O Mark, ele já utilizou e já realizou mais de 100 testes de CP em aquários dele e de clientes. E o foco tem sempre sido na detecção de metais pesados. Não na detecção, ah, tô com o estrôncio baixo, eu vou lá e vou botar um monte de estrôncio. Não, o foco está sendo na detecção de contaminantes. Ele relatou também a questão de diferentes precisões de clientes, né? de que, por exemplo, quando ele mandou um teste, um cliente dele também mandou de um aquário completamente diferente e os dois tiveram resultados parecidos. Assim como os dois, em uma outra ocasião, apontaram altos em vez de ferro, que é bem pouco provável, improvável. Então, o foco dele está sendo nesses contaminantes. And uh, you mentioned to me about heavy metal. Have you found anything when using ECP testing? Yeah, I mean, I've, I had a heater fail. Um, it was a titanium tube heater and it failed and the water got into it. Mm -hmm. And I knew it, you know, probably very likely put some contaminants in my tank, but I didn't know what. So I just sent off a Triton sample. And in the Triton sample, I was able to see what exactly it dumped. Uh, into my tank. I think I can look that up. I can probably send it to you, uh, Ido. So and, you uh, use Triton, right? Uh, I do. I use Triton. And then there's here in the United States, we have icpanalysis.com. I see. Oh, it, from the bald guy. Yes. Yeah, from Coralview. So I, I sent off a test to them and had off the charts copper uh, and aluminum, which is what I expected. I'm just look at logging on and see if I can pull it up for you so you can share it with everyone. Um dos problemas que ele identificou utilizando o ICP, né? Ele usa muito da Triton, mas ele também usa o ICP Analysis, que é um dos patrocinadores do Coral View. E uh, apontou os contaminantes por causa de um aquecedor que falhou e que deu problema na aquário dele. Ele está dando uma olhada agora para ver se ele acha os testes para compartilhar conosco. Mark, if you want, you can share the screen. You just click on the three dots and show us what you're seeing. Yeah, I've got to find it first. So I may have to send it to you after, you know, because this can take okay. a couple minutes. Don't worry. Um, but it was, it definitely showed that stuff was off the charts uh, when that heater failed. So that was useful. I mean, I did a big water change anyway. Mm -hmm. I added some uh, heavy metal absorbing material to my tank, but it was still interesting to see you know, what exactly got dumped into my tank because that heater failed. In USA, there are many brands, right? There is ATI, there is uh, Triton, the one that started, there is the ICP testing. Oh, which, which makes your decision process? Why sometimes you use one, why sometimes you use another? Um, sometimes it's just what I have at the house. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's like for a long time, Uh, for the Tritons, I had to go to the post office and mm -hmm. get pay for it, and then they'd give me a stamp and I could send it. Mm -hmm. And the other ones were already prepaid, so I just had to put it in my mailbox. Oh. Um, so, you know, I think they're all probably about pretty close to one another in terms of quality. And now Triton, the envelope gives you postage in it, so you can just drop it in your mailbox and send it. So, you know, I have a relationship with the Triton guys, and we Sean. Uh, personally. Oh, that's nice. So I probably start using him more. Ele, ele simplesmente o critério de escolha dele foi porque o que ele tinha em casa, né? Antigamente a Triton não fazia, uh, não fornecia etiqueta de despacho. Agora ele fornece etiqueta de despacho. Então ele só precisa colocar na caixa de correio, o correio vai lá e coleta. E ele relatou também que ele tem uma relação pessoal com o Essam que é o proprietário da, da Triton e que agora ele vai dar dando mais foco nisso. And uh, which are the, the 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 method that you rely on keeping your reef tanks? You do rely on water changes. You how you do the nutrient export? Um, yeah. So sorry, I right, was it? Uh, sorry. Okay, I found the analysis. I'll send it to you because I got to do some stuff. Okay. Um, to let you do that. So to answer your question, I am big on doing what the tank um, 
tells me that it needs. So I don't do water changes until I have a nutrient problem. And that okay. depends on if it's a fish only tank or a reef tank. Mm -hmm. For example, a reef tank, once nitrates get above five, then I do a water change. Mm -hmm. And about phosphates? Uh, 1.0 or 0 .1, 0 0.1 parts per million, then I'll do a water change. Ele evita fazer fazer trocas d'água, tá? Ele não, não, não tem como foco fazer PA preventiva. Ele faz quando o aquário aponta. Quando, por exemplo, está 5 ppm do nitrato, quando está acima de 0.1 o fosfato. Então, ele, ele acompanha o tanque dele e faz isso quando necessário. Um, so, it's not uncommon for when I set up a tank for someone, as you're adding fish to the tank. Mm -hmm. They may not do a water change for six months to a year because the tank doesn't need it. I'm not someone to do something just because I need to do it. But you do regular testing, right? For nitrates and once, phosphates. Yeah, once a week. Mm -hmm. E uma vez por once semana. Week. Então ele, mais uma vez, se baseia quando estão com os contaminantes altos. E uma vez por semana ele faz esse acompanhamento. And uh, regarding nutrient export, what do you do for it? Uh, really water changes. I mean, I have good skimmers. I have GFO. I have activated carbon. That's on all my tanks. Mm -hmm. And then now if I have the space, I will put a refugium on a tank. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes... Macrology, a right? Catamorpha? Yep. Um, it takes a big refugium to get any real nutrient export out of it. Uhum. So not everyone has the space. Hoje o foco dele está na utilização, na exportação de nutrientes com GFO, com carvão ativado, né, para fazer a limpeza da água, e com, com absorvedores, com tipos de absorvedores. E se ele tivesse espaço, sim, ele faria aí uma, um reator de macroalgas, né, faria um espaço para macroalgas. Então ele só não faz isso por causa do tempo. Let me check your analysis. Which ones is the one that showed up? You can share that if that helps you. So it's, it was the aluminium, right? So aluminium uh, and on copper. Eight. Aluminium copper and was copper. Copper supposed to be 0.1 and copper was 5.7. Mm -hmm. Let me share it over here with the audience so they can see it as well. Então, este aqui é o teste dele, tá? Quando ele teve aquele problema lá com o aquecedor, estourou o cobre aqui. Foi a 5.77 ppb, microgramas por litro, tá? E o alumínio dele também estava alto. Depois eu vou questionar aí o, o Jeff se isso daí pode ter vindo do, do aquecedor ou de alguma outra fonte. Se o Jeff está ouvindo, poderia responder, por favor. Vamos lá para a próxima pergunta. And uh, one thing that I want to ask you is uh, how, how you do the, the reposition of the macro elements and also trace elements. You do it to a brand? Do you do single PA, PA products? How do you do that? Me, most of my tanks are larger. So I'm usually mainly using uh, calcium reactors. Mm -hmm. The tank is under 200 gallons, um, okay. which is about 1,600 liters, I believe. Um, then I will use dosing. Mm -hmm. And which dosing brand you are using? You normally use? Um, you know, I'm not as loyal to a specific brand. Mm -hmm. So 757 liters is about my cutoff for when I'll start. Under that, I go dose. Above that, I go calcium reactor. Um, então, o foco deles nos aquários, ele sempre procura utilizar reatores de cálcio, né, por causa do tamanho dos tanques. E ele não é leal a nenhuma, nenhuma marca. Depende da opção do cliente, depende do, do literalmente do gosto do, do cliente. Tá? Uh, vamos para a próxima pergunta. Seção de espécie de plástico de equipamentos que vão dentro do aquário. Acho que isso é uma fuga elétrica. Bom, mais perguntas específicas aqui. Eu quero pegar e fazer um outro questionamento para ele, que está dentro do, 
do nosso, do nosso roteiro, e é sobre tanques bare bottoms, tanques sem substratos. Vou perguntar qual que é a opinião dele sobre isso e se ele tem muitas requisições, se isso é muito difundido lá nos Estados Unidos. Mark, regarding bare bottom tanks, what's your personal opinion about it? Do you have many clients asking for it? How it is over there in USA? So personally, I don't like the look of it because when I go to the beach, I see sand and I like the way it looks in the tank and I have uh -huh. fish like leopard grasses that need to sleep in the sand to feel comfortable. Um, can you run a tank without sand and it works? Yes. Can you run it with sand and it works? Yes. Um, it's, I mean, it is nice in a way because you can really crank up the flow. You don't really have to worry about blowing sand. For me personally, I like the look of sand. É, é possível ter sucesso com ou sem substrato. Aí ele gosta, particularmente gosta de ter substrato, porque quando tu vai na praia, tu vê isso, né? Tu vê o substrato lá. Então, ainda existem espécies, espécies específicas de, de animais que precisam dormir no meio do substrato para se sentirem confortáveis, como, por exemplo, os vraces. E no USA, this is, uh, many people use it, or it's... It's went down already. Um, it's kind of a trend right now. Some people do. I don't think it's that frequent, but people are asking about it more. That's for sure. Uh -huh. Na nos Estados Unidos isso é uma uma moda. Tem muitas pessoas perguntando a respeito, mas não não tem nada significativo para para falar. And uh, what's your personal opinion regarding the industry about the reef keeping industry here in USA and all over the world? What you believe is going to happen? How you believe it's doing? It's interesting times because with all these lockdowns, people are at home mm -hmm. and looking at their fish tanks, which is great because a lot of projects that uh, got put off are getting done because people are home. And uh, do you see the industry growing over there in USA? Uh, the data that we have seems to be that it's pretty much flat. Uh, the amount of people coming in and the amount of people going out, um, which, you know, I think it, it doesn't have to be overly complicated to have a successful tank. And I would love to see more people in it because of the enjoyment uh, and the beauty of these animals in your house. Hoje, uh, em relação à indústria, ele acredita que praticamente está estável. O número de pessoas entrando e saindo continua mesmo. Mas uh, ele acredita que pode ter um crescimento, especialmente nessa época de isolamento social que está acontecendo lá com toda a força nos Estados Unidos. E as pessoas estão simplesmente trabalhando nos projetos e botando o serviço atrasado que estava aí nos tanques. Então, acredito assim que existe a possibilidade de um, de um crescimento para o nosso hobby. Pessoal, antes a gente já está se aproximando do final já. Eu gostaria de pedir para quem ainda não se vocês estão gostando desse vídeo, para clicarem no joinha. Para quem não é inscrito no canal, se inscreverem no canal, caso estejam gostando. Mais uma vez, nós vamos ter uma nova rota aí de, de entrevistas, né? Semana que vem, na terça-feira, com o Mark Leveson. E eu quero agradecer aí o, o Jeff, do Riff Tech, o Tami, do Expert do Riff Marine, o Luiz Motter, do Expert Marine, e o um Marcão aí do, do Help Riff. Todos eles aí são parceiros e bons amigos. Nós vamos procurar mais uma questão aí para atender, para responder. E depois disso nós vamos, nós vamos encerrar esta entrevista. Mark, we are going to the last question. Uh, do you think it's advisable to avoid coral warfare, like putting toadstools and mushrooms together across, together with the acros? Um, you know, that, that's a great question. I like it personally from a look standpoint, because when I go dive in the ocean, there's lots of stuff touching one another. Um, and I like the grown in type of look. So, you know, some corals can touch one another and they don't care. Some corals get close to one another and they sting each other and fight. You know, if I have two nice acros next to one another, yeah, I'll trim them to keep them apart. But some corals, I just 
let run over one another or some of them, if I don't really care about them, I'll just let them duke it out, fight it out and whoever wins, wins and that's nature and I get to see it in my house. And regarding the toxicity of the toadstools, for example, I believe that Sanjay used it to talk a lot about it But how about your opinion regarding it? Because we have heard that uh, when we keep toadstools and also some of the soft corals, they can generate toxins that affect the growth from the Acroporus, for example. So if I had a big leather, then um, I could see that being a problem. But with smaller pieces, I'm not that concerned about it, especially, I mean, if it was grown in, then I would probably let it go. But if it's small and I can move it around, yeah, then I would go ahead and move it along. A pergunta, pessoal, foi do Paulinho, do Riff and Dive. E ele perguntou sobre a questão da guerra química que uh, acontece, é uma, um, um conhecimento, o pessoal fala através de empirismo, aí, sobre a guerra química com leathers, com corais soft, e se eles afetam ou não as acroporas, por exemplo. Em relação a essa questão da guerra química, o Mark relatou que ele deixa quem ganhar, ganhou, em relação às acroporas, por exemplo. Mas, uh, quando, caso ele tivesse um grande leather dentro do aquário, ele iria se preocupar, mas os pequenos, tamanhos pequenos e médios, não, não faria tanta diferença. Ou, a uh, Another question uh, regarding when you need to move homes. You mentioned to me that you moved your, ho your home from uh, Texas to back to Tennessee and you moved the tank with you. Which advices would you give for people facing this, uh, this situation? Um, it's going to take longer than you think. Mm -hmm. Number one, to tear it down and set it up. Number two, take frags um, and spread them out across tanks. So give them to your friends a local fish store, um, whoever it is that you trust, because your corals are very likely not going to be happy about being moved and you want to build a, a bank, kind of an insurance type of thing, and you can go back and get frags if you lose some other colonies. And how about substrate? People say that you need to wash it up so you reduce the, the contaminants level. You did it? Would you suggest With, advise it, people doing it? It's so affordable here in the United States. I tell people just to throw it out. They'll be, you'll be amazed at how much detritus and junk is in there. It's not worth trying to wash it and save it. And maybe you got it out. Just throw it out or give it to someone who's starting out and start with new. A pergunta veio do Ledo, também um grande amigo lá de Caxias do Sul, sobre quais conselhos que ele daria para alguém que estivesse mudando de cidade. O Mark, como eu relatei no começo dessa entrevista, ele se mudou do Texas de volta para o Tennessee e ele levou o tanque com ele. Então, as sugestões eram, os conselhos, é né, que vai demorar muito mais tempo do que tu pensa até ele ficar em, em equilíbrio. Segundo, que tu coloques, que tu dê mudas para amigos, para lojas, para que tu faça assim, uma espécie de banco. Caso algum morra, tu já tenha já segurança que tu vai ter a, a, o coral de novo. E em relação ao substrato daquela pergunta velha de lavar ou não, ele relatou que simplesmente se compra um novo, porque acumula muita, muita sujeira, muita, muita porcaria no substrato. Então, se ele estivesse na nossa condição, eu acredito que lavar seria uma opção, sim. Então, eu gostaria de agradecer a presença de todos, Agradecer a presença do Mark. Foi muito, muito proveitosa. Espero que vocês tenham gostado também dessa live. Nós vamos estar deixando algumas questões que, se não forem respondidas, eu depois vou questionar ele. Nós vamos trazer aí nos comentários. Podem responder, perguntar aí nos comentários, pessoal do vídeo. Mais uma vez, deem aquele joinha. Isso ajuda bastante a gente. E quem não é inscrito no canal, se inscreva para acompanhar as próximas entrevistas. Mark. In name of the Brazilian audience, the Brazilian aquarists, I would like to thank you very much for this uh, exclusive interview. It's quite a pity that uh, we were planning to have you here, but we had this terrible situation, this COVID situation. And uh, man, I'm quite pleased to talk with you. As I mentioned, I'm a long time subscriber. 
you. for more than seven years and it's a great pleasure to have you there and it's truly amazing that you don't have so much white hair like myself and you're, you're older than me <laughs> well it's I, I wish i could be there i certainly appreciate the invitation to come and the invitation to talk again today uh, it's fun to hear people who watch because I put up a video and then the next day I look at how many people watched it and I don't know who these people are who watched it, but getting to know you, uh, you know, hearing questions from the crowd gives me a little bit of insight to who's doing the watching and I appreciate all the views. O Mark fica muito feliz também estar aqui. Eu comentei que era uma pena que ele não vai conseguir vir, né, por causa da situação do, do, da Covid. O nosso evento, acredito que vai ser postergado este ano, né? no evento do TAMT, e ele fica muito feliz em também escutar as nossas, os nossos comentários, as nossas perguntas aí. Relatei para ele que eu sou um inscrito no canal dele já há pelo menos sete anos e que eu, é uma grande honra para mim estar tá escutando ele. Mark, thank you very much. I hope that we have uh, more time in the future to talk about. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Stay, stay safe, everyone. Wash your hands and enjoy your tanks. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Bye-bye and see you next. Alrighty, thank you. <laughs>